Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Triceratops. Somehow we've made it to the 30th episode without using Triceratops as the dinosaur of the day, and a lot of dinosaur news. So first in the news is something that's actually in my wheelhouse as a chemical engineer, and it's about how some paleontologists have looked at fibrous structures that are actually fossilized. The article is published in Nature Communications, and it's titled, Fibers and Cellular Structures Preserved in 75 Million Year Old Dinosaur Specimens, and written by Sergio Bartazzo and colleagues. So in it, they describe discovering two different things in a few dinosaur bones, and they're quick to point out that they're not exceptionally preserved fossils. They're kind of average fossils. What they did was they used different surface analysis techniques, like scanning electron microscopy and tunneling electron microscopy, which are both used at the micro to nanometer scale to really get a detailed view of the surface of any kind of material. And then they use something that's called TOF SIMS, which stands for Time of Flight Secondary Ion Mass Spectrometry. And they use that technique to analyze the exact composition of the surface of the material. So it's kind of similar to what we talked about in the laser analysis technique where you focus a beam of energy on it and it emits ions that can be analyzed through sensors that are focused on the beam path, and they can actually get an idea of what the specimen is made out of. Typically, in fossilization, minerals replace all of the materials, and so you're only left with whatever minerals were in the water or in the earth surrounding the fossil when it fossilized. But in this case, they found that actually there is some organic material that fossilizes along with the rest of the material. And it's not a lot, and it is fairly degraded, like we talked about, DNA doesn't last that long. But there was enough there to tell that there were some certain amino acids in the fossil, and they could also find traces of collagen based on the structure that they saw when they were looking at the electron microscope and then comparing it with the chemical composition. And then they also think they found some blood vessels. It's very interesting that they found some of this soft tissue that was preserved, and they said it wasn't the first time that someone's had this idea since there have been some flexible fossils. I haven't seen that before, but I guess they found some things that were a little bendable, which you wouldn't expect from just a mineral. And they hope that this research will help paleontologists understand better some of their behavior and what they might have looked like and acted like since so much of a creature is defined by what its soft tissue looks and is structured like. Next in the news, I'm going to be a bit of a buzzkill. <laughs> Or maybe not, it depends on what your opinion on the subject is. But there have been a fair number of articles in the popular media that were titled something like, Most Dinosaurs Didn't Have Feathers, you know, Stop Thinking of Dinosaurs as Feathered, They Actually Just Had Scales, and things like that. But all of these articles stem from a common journal article titled Evolution of Dinosaur Epidermal Structures by Paul M. Barrett and some of his colleagues, and it was published in Biology Letters. So even though there were a lot of articles saying that most dinosaurs had scales and not feathers, really what the study was trying to figure out was whether the common ancestor of all dinosaurs probably had feathers. And they did this by looking at all of the dinosaur specimens they could figure out and find <laughs> that had impressions of either scales or feathers, and usually they can kind of determine when they have a skin impression whether they thought it had one or the other. And then classifying all of the other dinosaur species based on their common cousins and aunts and uncles and <laughs> grandparents in the taxonomy to try to figure out if those other dinosaurs had feathers and then try to trace it back to the common ancestor statistically and guess if the common ancestor had feathers. And what they decided based on their analysis and interpretation of the data is that the common ancestor probably didn't have feathers. But that really has nothing to do with whether most dinosaurs had feathers or not because we know that ornithopods had feathers at least at some point and all theropods had feathers and some other dinosaurs have been 
shown possibly having feathers. So saying that most dinosaurs didn't have feathers or did have feathers based on the common ancestor is completely misleading. Really what they showed was that all dinosaurs probably didn't have feathers because if the common ancestor had feathers and you can show a smattering of feathers later on, you just assume that they all had it. But all they're saying is that the common ancestor probably didn't have feathers, so you can't say that all dinosaurs had feathers. So it's kind of misinterpretation of their data. They were just trying to confirm with the trend towards more dinosaurs being found with feathers, whether all of them might have had it or if some of them might have had it, and they're saying, well, it's some, probably not all. Next in the news is a new dinosaur discovery that comes out of Wales, and it was fossil hunting brothers Nick and Rob Hannigan who stumbled upon some bones when they were looking through a low tide area on the coast in Wales. They do this pretty often, so they're, that's why they call them fossil hunters, and they had always planned to try to find something interesting and then donate it to a museum if they could find something good. Back in 2014, they stumbled on what they had hoped at the time was a dinosaur, and they recently gave it to the National Museum Wales. So now that they've donated it to the National Museum Wales, the scientists there have confirmed that it is a dinosaur, and they believe that it may be the oldest Jurassic theropod. So based on their analysis of the bones, they think that it would have been about 20 inches high, which is kind of short, but it would have been about six and a half feet long. It gives you the kind of idea of the proportions, kind of like a Gallimimus or any of those stiff-tailed, running-around guys. It appeared to have small blade-like teeth, probably living on insects, and maybe some other small mammals or possibly little reptiles that were around back then. It's kind of interesting. They haven't completely taken all the bones out of the rock and put them on display yet. What they did was they have the pieces that have lots of exposed fossils in them and they put them in display cases and then they put up a graphic of all the bones that they can see sticking out of the rock and where they think they would lie in the body of a theropod and then what they thought the overall theropod would look like with some nice drawings of it and things. If I was in England <laughs> or anywhere in the UK I'd probably make my way over to Wales to check this out because it's pretty unique. We've got another dinosaur discovery to talk about. This one was discovered back in 2012, and it's a nearly complete Torvosaurus, and nearly complete in paleontological terms means 55% is pretty good, and that's about what they've found of this Torvosaurus. They named it Elvis. I couldn't find exactly why, but it was huge, which may be <laughs> why, and it, it's pretty important because it's got a nearly complete or maybe completely complete <laughs> backbone. And that gives a really good estimation of the size of the dinosaur because typically the tissue doesn't extend too far past the end of the skeleton, so you can get a really good length estimate of the animal rather than trying to guess from like a femur or things like they do when they look at one of those titanosaurs we talked about earlier. The interesting thing about it is a lot of people kind of think of Jurassic Park and they think of Tyrannosaurus rex as ruling it. But they don't realize that Tyrannosaurus rex wasn't even close to being around yet in the Jurassic period. And based on this fossil, they can say that Torvosaurus could grow up to the same size as Tyrannosaurus rex, but it was around back in the Jurassic period, making it most likely the largest predator in the Jurassic era. And this is the first really rigorous evidence of that. The other neat thing is the holotype of Torvosaurus is at the BYU Museum. And when you combine bones from that holotype with this recently discovered Torvosaurus, you can recreate 85% of the animal without having to guess at any of the bones at all, just piecing together the missing pieces between the two, which is really neat. They're looking for a museum to possibly house the fossil because they want to uh, donate it to be displayed. But the article I read on Fossilera didn't indicate that they had found anyone yet. Next in the news is something you might be able to do in your spare time <laughs> if you're in Texas or the surrounding states in the U.S. They published an interactive map that shows where you can find dinosaur tracks 
or extinct volcanoes or fault lines or various other geological features. It's an evolution of a project started in 2002 where the Texas Water Science Center decided to digitize 38 of their maps of the geological area in Texas. And in 2007, they finished it with 145,000 geological points all over the state. And they've now further refined it to be an interactive map and it shows a road map on top of the geographical map, which if you've ever tried to find something just on a geographical map, <laughs> can be pretty difficult. So it's really useful for average people to look at and see the roads, and then you could even look at a road that you normally drive on and just kind of see like, oh, that hill is there because of the edge of an extinct volcano or something. It could be really cool. And you can find it at tx.usgs.gov if you're interested. The Guardian posted a really cool in-depth article called Dinomania, the story of our obsession with dinosaurs, and basically it chronicles humans discovering dinosaurs and how people have reacted to the discovery of dinosaurs and how dinosaurs have become part of our culture. So it mentions how in China, dinosaurs were identified as dragon bones. In, in North America, the Plains Indians had tales of the Thunderbird that were probably inspired by pterosaur fossils. And then in the early 19th century in Britain, dinosaurs became a really big deal. They started off with the discovery of a bunch of bones in 1824 and was eventually named Megalosaurus, basically massive lizard, and there were also discoveries of Iguanodon, and then there were some professional fossil hunters like Mary Onning, who found fossils of plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs and even some pterosaurs. And then this led to Richard Owen founding London's Natural History Museum and in 1842 coining the term terrible lizard, dinosaurs. And in 1851, there was a great exhibition that had scale models of dinosaurs. So the sculptor talked to Richard Owen about it and they unveiled a diorama of a megalosaurus, which was depicted at the time as scaly and bulky and of course uh, had menacing teeth and jaws. These discoveries impacted culture in a way. Charles Dickens in Bleak House wrote about a megalosaur wandering in Holborn Hill. And this idea of bringing or of dinosaurs coming back to life or bringing dinosaurs back to life started off really early on in, in when people started learning about dinosaurs. In 1830, Charles Lyell published Principles of Geology, and he talked about how climate change is cyclical over Earth and that maybe the iguanodon would come back. Interestingly, within about a decade of Megalosaurus being named, dinosaurs came to be seen as futuristic in science. New dinosaurs were discovered around the world, and eventually people started going to North America to find new dinosaur bones, and of course there were the bone warrens between Cope and Marsh, which The Guardian says ended with both of Cope and Marsh lost their fortunes and Andrew Carnegie came in and ended up funding the hunt for dinosaur bones and he really wanted giant dinosaurs. So one of his contributions for that is the giant Diplodocus cast that's in the Natural History Museum in London, which unfortunately might be taken away in 2017, but... Anyway, in 1902, Barnum Brown, whose nickname is Mr. Bones, found the first documented remains of T-Rex. And he also found a whole bunch of fossils in Alberta, Canada, which ended up being sent to the American Museum of Natural History in New York, and they ended up with one of the largest collections of dinosaur bones. The company who funded his expedition in shipping all the bones to the Natural History Museum was Sinclair Oil Company, and in their advertising, they claimed that their premium oil had been, quote, mellowed 80 million years, and then they made their logo a brontosaurus. But unfortunately, over the years, the way the public saw dinosaurs changed. Sauropods and, like, the brontosaurus logo, Sinclair Oil Company, during the Great Depression became symbols of failure. You see these dinosaurs, they drag their tail, they've got small brains, they're very slow, and then dinosaur became, as the Guardian puts it, a term of abuse, and which we still kind of see today. There's a lot of articles in the media that pop up like, oh, the dinosaurs in tech, or it's become kind of a term is no longer relevant. 
and dinosaurs became these kind of kitschy toys for children, and then they turned T Rex into Barney, and it's very different from the Victorian era where dinosaurs were seen as this awesome thing. Although in the Guardian article, they talk about Theodore Adorno, who sees dinosaurs as a symbol of totalitarianism. So there's like a King Kong film. But then in the 1980s, the father and son team. Lewis and Walter Alvarez wrote a paper about how a giant asteroid had killed the dinosaurs, which kind of helped the public see dinosaurs not so much as failures, but as victims of their own success. They were so big by this point, the end of the Cretaceous, and so specialized and adapted to their niches that that was kind of their downfall when there was this mass extinction. Apparently, in the 1960s, there was a quote-unquote dinosaur renaissance, this was when Deinonychus was first described by John Ostrom, and Deinonychus has the terrible claw, it's got those sickle-like talons, and it could rip apart prey. And there's also uh, Robert Bacher who wrote The Dinosaur Heresies, and he talked about that dinosaurs were probably warm-blooded, and maybe they weren't actually reptiles. So the public began to be interested in dinosaurs again, and you could see this in changes to the way dinosaurs were depicted in museums. For example, in the Museum of Natural History in London, the Diplodocus, instead of dragging the tail on the ground, has its head up. In the American Museum of Natural History, there was a sauropod that is depicted as rearing up to protect her young. And then, of course, in 1993, we had the film Jurassic Park, which showed dinosaurs as these agile creatures and using, at the time, cutting-edge technology, CGI, to make dinosaurs, you know, quick and very realistic-looking, very different from stop-motion technology that had previously shown dinosaurs as very slow. However, that was more than 20 years ago, and we've learned a lot about dinosaurs since then, so the article goes on to talk about how, well, Jurassic World decided, no, we're going to just kind of subtly hint at these things that we know. There's images of birds, but then a lot of the dinosaurs that we now think had feathers were depicted as scaly. And so some of the reasons were could be hard to make look realistic in CGI, or it could be issues with continuity, but there's also the author speculates that maybe this having dinosaurs with feathers is un-American because there's a lot of dinosaurs found in China and Mongolia that have feathers or prototypes of feathers, dino fuzz or something, but the giant dinosaurs in America haven't really been depicted that way. So it's just interesting how our conceptions of dinosaurs have been evolving or along with what we know about them. So last week we talked about the dinosaur autopsy, or T-Rex autopsy to be more specific. We mentioned how it was a show on the National Geographic channel, and they took a different approach to talking about dinosaurs where they made a huge life-size T-Rex cadaver and put it on a stage, and then they invited a paleontologist, a veterinarian, and a couple other people to come take a look at it. And there's an article that's on The Guardian that describes exactly how they did it, which is pretty interesting because if you watched the show or if you watch the show in the future, you'll see a pretty realistic looking autopsy type thing. Like they cut through different parts of the T-Rex and it kind of bleeds and it, you can see the tissue and there are all these organs that they pull out. You have to go through different layers that separate off organs the t-rex probably have like other animals have and they go through the gastralia that we mentioned in an earlier episode and lots of interesting stuff they talk about just exactly how they did it in this article and how they would make clay models of things and send them off to paleontologists to make sure everything was right and then all the materials they had to use for instance they used four tons of clay 100 liters of latex 200 liters of silicone rubber 600 liters of polyester resin and hundreds of meters of fiberglass mat which seems like a lot for a dinosaur that was not that huge i mean it was big but man that's a lot of materials especially considering a lot of that stuff expands quite a bit but i think they're talking about the whole sculpting process and you have to make things out of polystyrene and coat it and then you know you use that to make your latex skin over the surface of it 
So I think a lot of that didn't actually end up in the final creature. It was also interesting because apparently all of the people who were on the show doing the dissection weren't actors. And I'm not sure if that was really a good idea for them or not. <laughs> because it was nice that if you know about dinosaurs, they were always speaking very intelligently about what they were doing. And you could tell that they had a good understanding of the current state of the science. But on the bad side, when you have a two-hour show filled with non-actors, but they still kind of have to fit to a certain premise because they there were only certain places they could cut through that were, you know, actually prepared for that because it is a creation after all. It's not a real T-Rex, so they couldn't just do whatever they wanted. They had to kind of say why they were going to do certain things. And since they weren't actors, you watch it and you're like, are they just really bad actors or is this just super contrived? But actually, as the show went on, I started to uh, really enjoy it because they could lend a lot of detail into the elements of it. So it probably was a good idea, but it was just kind of interesting when you first watch it. You're like, ugh, this does not seem well produced. But then when you realize, oh, they're all real people, you kind of appreciate it a little better. So they talk about some of the fossils they used to create the T-Rex. They used a cast skull from Stan and they used an arm from Sue, and also a foot from Stan, and they used a lot of information that they got from a skeletal scan of Sue, since that's such a complete T-Rex specimen. And then they interpreted a lot of what the organs and things would look like based on modern close relatives. Then they would make their 3D models of it and send it off to scientists, as I mentioned before, they went into the full process of creating all the organs and things. It reminded me a little bit of Mythbusters, actually, because they used that silicone rubber for their organs, and they could dye it different colors and make it soft, or they could make it more tough. One of the most interesting things I thought was they cut the stomach open, they showed the gizzard, which has a big muscle on the side of it, and one of the, the guy who was the veterinarian squeezed the gizzard to show how the muscle would work, and it looked pretty realistic. It was kind of cool. One other kind of interesting thing that they talked about in this interview with one of the creators is that they actually added smells to everything, too. And in the show, they react to the smells, but I had assumed that they were just pretending that it smelled bad and... It turns out that they actually had added these smells just to, like, give the actors something to enjoy, I guess. Well, the non-actors. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> so if you haven't seen the show, it'll probably re-air on the National Geographic channel. It apparently took them almost six months and thousands and thousands of hours to make. So they'll probably try to get their money back on it by re-airing it lots of times. So you should check it out if you didn't get a chance to see it the first time. Next, I just want to talk a little bit about the game Ark Survival Evolved that released on Steam a couple weeks ago for early access. I mentioned that I was going to try to get into it and play it a little bit, and I had a chance to play it for a couple hours, and it is really fun. <laughs> if you don't remember from an earlier episode, it's a survival-style game, so you show up on an island and you don't have any clothes or any skills, really. And then you have to run around and try to find just how to survive. And you, you have to drink and you have to eat and you have to stay warm or stay cool, depending on the environment. And the first probably four times you respawn if you die. But the first four times I, I didn't figure out anything. I just kept getting killed by things. <laughs> but then eventually I found out that you can punch a tree and then break pieces of wood off it and things. And then you can gather berries and stuff like that. And then you get experience points that you can use to learn how to make pants or make a shirt or make a spear or make a hatchet or whatever. And you can make a campfire to warm up and a torch. And you can either go down the, I'm going to hunt all the dinosaurs because there's dinosaurs all over the place. And there's also dodo birds and there's fish in the rivers. And I went out swimming trying to find a big scary mosasaurus or something. But the only thing I found was a huge turtle in the water that looked at all intimidating. But the other option is you can try to feed and nurture the dinosaurs and kind of domesticate them, which I did not get nearly good enough to attempt <laughs> because I was just trying to survive basically when I was playing the game. It was pretty funny though because I stumbled into this guy. It's an all online game and there was somebody riding a dinosaur and he hopped off, and you can chat through the game. And I said, hey, how's it going? You know, nice dinosaur. What happened to your clothes? Because he's completely naked, and you'd think someone who had tamed these dinosaurs 
would have uh, made pants by that point. <laughs> and he said, oh, I just glitched through the bottom of the game, and so I died, and now I had to, you know, I have to recreate all that stuff. So that was a good indication of kind of the state of the game. It's still very buggy. There's a lot of those types of problems, and that's why it's an early access game. I guess that's how creators get input on games before they're fully developed. They release it that way, and then they can work out the bugs. And an article I saw on Steamed, where another guy was playing the game, he talks about, too, how it runs really slow on his computer. And I noticed that on my computer, which is not a desktop with relatively good <laughs> components. So it plays most games fine, but this one was pretty jittery. So it obviously needs to be optimized. It might be kind of difficult to play on a laptop or something. But as far as the general fun of the game and whether or not it's worth playing, I think since if you're listening to this podcast, you're interested in dinosaurs, if you have a PC and you're into first-person kind of, not really shooter, but strategy online games, it's definitely worth playing. It's a lot of fun. I think it's maybe $20 or something. I think I saw it was on sale for about 20 bucks on Steam. So check it out. So just another quick thing on The Guardian. The Guardian did a list of five of the best dinosaur films. So if you want to see something after you've seen Jurassic World, they recommend The Lost World, which was made in 1925, Godzilla, the 1954 version, One Million Years B.C. from 1966, The Land That Time Forgot from 1975, and then, of course, Jurassic Park, the original from 1993. They also have a list of the five best dinosaur books, if you're looking for something to read, so there's Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne, The Lost World by Arthur Conan Doyle, Dinosaur Tales by Ray Bradbury, which I actually didn't know he did that, so I'm going to have to check it out, Bully for Brontosaurus by Stephen Jay Gould, and Tyrannosaurus Drip by Julia Donaldson and David Roberts. And of course I'm going to have to plug our own books in here. We have three dinosaur books, two of which are out right now, Top 10 Dinosaurs of 2014, and what Happened to Brontosaurus, and a novel coming out soon, Dinosaur Wars, The Fall of Two Kingdoms. And I wanted to leave on something fun for the news. There's a great video that Mashable posted where Dr. Paul E. Olson from Columbia University takes a bunch of little dinosaur toys and just talks about all the scientific inaccuracies within them. It's something that I can't resist doing usually when I am looking at these dinosaur toys and I think two of the things that they get wrong a lot are just because it's easier to create them so they tend to not have any feathers which he points out and they also tend to have a tail on the ground but that kind of is necessary to make them stand up because if they just have the two feet it's kind of difficult to balance them but there's a lot of other interesting things that these dinosaurs have going on. That it's worth checking out the video. It's about three and a half minutes, so highly recommended for a laugh. And last, on YouTube, there's this great video going around. The Warp Zone worked with Peter Hollins, who has a YouTube channel. I guess he does acapella. And they do a cover, an acapella cover, of the Jurassic Park theme song. So that's worth checking out. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, which is Triceratops, and made an appearance in Jurassic World and Jurassic Park, of course. We've mentioned Triceratops before in episode 21 in our interview with Josh Cotton, where he was telling us about the big debates between Triceratops and Taurosaurus, which I'll go into in a little bit again. So Triceratops' name means three-horned face. There's two species right now. It's Triceratops horridus and Triceratops horrorsus. Charles Marsh named Triceratops in 1889, and Triceratops is quadrupedal, which means it walks on four legs, and it was an herbivore, and it had a very large skull. It's a ceratopsian, specifically a chasmosaurinae, and it's grouped as a chasmosaurinae because it has brow horns. And Chasmosaurinae, again, is a subfamily of Ceratopsid. Triceratops lived in the Cretaceous, and it was one of the last dinosaurs to go extinct. Its fossils have been found in the U.S. in Colorado, Montana, South Dakota, Wyoming, as well as Canada and Alberta and Saskatchewan. It grew to about 30 feet long, or 9 meters, and it weighed over 11,000 pounds, or 5,000 kilograms, though some may have weighed more than 15,000 pounds. Its skull was about one-third the length of its body, and it had a short neck frill and three horns. The two biggest horns were above Triceratops' eyes, about one meter long, and they had a smaller nose horn in the snout. A lot of Triceratops remains have been found, so it was 
a dominant herbivore in North America in the late Cretaceous. Triceratops is also one of the most popular dinosaurs, though there have been a lot of misconceptions and controversy over it. In the 1900s, a lot of Triceratops fossils were found, uh, but the skulls varied the way they looked a lot. So because of this, there were a lot of species that were named. But in 1986, two paleontologists, Ostrom and Velnhofer, wrote that there was only the type species, Triceratops horridus, was real, because the variation in the skulls was actually mixed just individuals looking a little different and fossils that were distorted over time. Since Triceratops was discovered in the 1800s, 16 species had been proposed, but now of course two are valid. Triceratops horridus probably evolved into Triceratops prorsus over the span of one to two million years, at least according to a 2014 study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences journal. This study examined fossils from the Hell Creek Formation, which had lower, middle, and upper geological subdivisions. So the middle subdivision fossils had a combination of features that were found in the lower and upper subdivisions, which is why they think Horridus evolved into the second Triceratops species. And Catherine Forrester wrote in a later study about the difference between Triceratops Horridus and Persis, as well as what was at one time known as Triceratops Hatchery but now has been named as a new genus as Nedoceratops hatchery. They were found in different levels of strata, which means that they're active at different times. So she's kind of the reason there are two valid species now instead of just one or possibly three. Other species that are kind of dubious that have been named as Triceratops are Albertensis, Altacornis, Gallius, Ingens, Maximus, and Sulcatus. But just for reference, Triceratops horridus means rough, for the rough texture of its bones. And of course, there's been a huge debate over Triceratops versus Taurosaurus. So just to recap what we talked about in episode 21, John Scanella theorized in 2009 that Triceratops was the same as Taurosaurus in a paper that was co-authored by Jack Horner. And they said that these animals lived at the same time because the fossils were found in the same places and Triceratops was a juvenile version of Taurosaurus. This is because Triceratops had a short frill and Taurosaurus had a longer frill with holes to reduce its weight. And they also said that Netoceratops was a growth stage between Triceratops and Taurosaurus. So the evidence that they used to support their theory is that other types of Ceratopsians, both juvenile and adult specimens, have been found where the juveniles have short frills and the adults have longer frills. This theory was very controversial. In 2011, Andrew Fark said that Netoceratops was its own genus and there was too much change required for a Triceratops skull to change to a Taurosaurus skull. And in 2012, Daniel Field and Nicholas Longridge from Yale University studied 35 specimens and they said there were skulls of juvenile Taurosaurus and adult Triceratops. And also in some locations, only Triceratops or only Taurosaurus were found. Scanella, his response was that some of the fossils that they had studied could be transitional. Either way, Taurosaurus was named in 1891 after Triceratops, which was named in 1889, so no matter what the outcome of the debate, Triceratops will keep its name. Going into the history of Triceratops, Triceratops fossil was found in Wyoming in the 1880s and shipped to the Smithsonian Museum in DC. It's been on display since 1905 and it was the first mounted Triceratops in the world. The original display had, according to the website, quote, skeletal elements from over a dozen different individual Triceratops, some of which weren't the same size and gave us bones that were too small for the skeleton. And it also had, quote, several sculpted elements that technicians made by hand and the foot bones of a different dinosaur, a duck dinosaur, to replace missing Triceratops bones. So uh, the way it's depicted is a little bit out of date, and in 2001 they unveiled a new mount that was more accurate. And this Triceratops in the Smithsonian in D.C. is nicknamed Hatcher. Scientists used to think Triceratops walked with its two front legs sprawled out to support its weight, more like a reptile, a lizard, but now they think that Triceratops walked upright with its elbows bowing out to the sides, like a modern rhinoceros. In a few ways it's similar to a modern rhinoceros. 
like it may have charged at predators. Triceratops had hoof-like claws and a thick bumpy hide and again large brows and in a 2006 study in the journal Proceedings of the Royal Society found that Triceratops brow horns twisted and lengthened with age so they started off very stubby then curved backward and then pointed in the opposite direction over time. Scientists have found a Triceratops skin impression which has bristle-like fibers so it probably had these fibers around the tail and Triceratops toes on its front two feet pointed to the sides not forwards, which is different from stegosaurs, ankylosaurs, and sauropods. Scientists consider this to be a primitive trait, and it shows that Ceratopsians' direct ancestors may have been bipedal, so they could have used their hands for grasping and support instead of just supporting their weight. To support its weight, Triceratops only used the first three digits of its toes, and digits four and five didn't have claws or hooves. Triceratops again may have charged at predators and it was large enough that only large predators could attack it such as Tyrannosaurus and Albertosaurus. A lot of Triceratops bones have been found damaged from fighting with predators and there's evidence that Triceratops and T-Rex fought. There's one Triceratops that had T-Rex tooth marks on its brown horn that had healed. The bitten horn was broken and new bone growth. There was new bone growth after the break. Triceratops may have had the advantage in the fight because of its sharp horns. Also, the frill would have protected its neck from T-Rex and other predators. So the horns in the frill may have been defensive weapons, but not all scientists agree that this was the main reason for them. Ceratopsians as a group have very different looking frills and horns, so the argument is they would have evolved to become the same and be the most effective. So the horns and frills may have also been used for display as a way to identify its own species. And frills have also been found with blood vessel impressions, so it could have had vivid color displays. The vivid color displays could have been for mating or for warning signs of danger. The large frill may have regulated body temperature as well. Some triceratops have been found with holes in the frills, possibly caused by combat among themselves. And what's interesting, we discussed this in a previous episode, there's a new chasmosaurian called Regulaceratops that was described earlier in June. And this dinosaur had crown plates around its head and features that independently evolved, which is a sign of convergent evolution. So it also may have had similar behaviors to other chasmosaurines, such as its fighting styles. So we know like modern mammals with similar shaped horns act similarly with horn locking or head butting. So possibly this happened with chasmosaurines too. Triceratops is often thought of as a herding animal, but there's actually no evidence that it was a herding animal. A lot of Triceratops fossils have been found as individuals, though there was one group of three juveniles found together. But one reason the Triceratops is thought of as a herding animal is that other horned dinosaurs have been known to live in herds. Bone beds have been found with two to hundreds or thousands of individuals together. But one reason it might not have been a herding animal was that Triceratops needed a lot of food to survive, so it would have been hard to consume enough food if you're in a large group. However, Triceratops may have lived in small groups, such as one male and multiple females, where the males may have fought each other for dominance, and this idea is based on what we see in modern animals. Some evidence for this is three juvenile Triceratops were found in southeastern Montana, and in 2012, another group of three Triceratops were found, including one small juvenile and adult, and they're found in Wyoming. They may have been a family, and there were signs of a T-Rex scavenging. There was puncture wounds from the teeth in the largest Triceratops' limbs. It's not clear how Triceratops raised its young. They hatched from eggs, though I don't believe any Ceratopsian eggs have been found so far. I think we discussed that in an earlier episode. Triceratops ate low-growing vegetation, but it may have taken down larger plants to get food it couldn't reach with just its teeth. Triceratops had a parrot-like beak and a battery of teeth. They had a lot of molars and premolars that were stacked together and used to grind leaves at the back of the mouth, and they continually replaced their teeth. There was a new study in the journal Science Advances that found that Triceratops had teeth that could slice through dense material, so it may have had a more varied diet than modern reptiles. Professor Erickson and his colleagues studied different Triceratops teeth from museums around North America, and they found that Triceratops had five layers of tissue, which is a lot compared to a horse and bison, which only have four layers, and crocodiles that only have two. These teeth created, quote, recessed central regions on cutting blades that reduced friction, and it's not clear if other dinosaurs and reptiles had these kinds of teeth. But Triceratops had jaws for grasping and plucking, not necessarily just biting. And again, the teeth were arranged in batteries of 36 to 40 tooth columns, each side of the jaw with 3 to 5 stacked teeth per column. So in total, they had between 430 to 800 teeth. 
Triceratops probably couldn't move too fast and spent a lot of its time grazing, like a rhinoceros. And again, there's so many Triceratops fossils that have been found, they're easy enough to find. Between 2000 and 2010 alone, 47 skulls were found in the Hell Creek Formation, although no complete Triceratops skeleton has been found yet. Triceratops has the largest skull among land animals, again, about one-third the length of its body. And interestingly, in 1889, a rancher in Wyoming, he found this strange skull on his property, and to haul it off, he tried to lasso the horns, but unfortunately the horns snapped off. Triceratops fossils, though, are in high demand, and it, the cost of owning a Triceratops fossil has risen. So in 1997, an average skull cost $2,500, but in 2008, somebody purchased a Triceratops for a million dollars and then donated it to the Boston Museum of Science. Triceratops is the official state fossil of South Dakota, and it's also Wyoming's state dinosaur. And it's appeared a lot in the media. For example, we've got Land Before Time, Sarah, the Triceratops, and of course, Jurassic Park and BBC's Walking with Dinosaurs, and now Jurassic World. A few months ago, or maybe last year, there was this funny Facebook post going around. It was a picture of Steven Spielberg next to a Triceratops, and it was a photo that was taken back in the early 90s when they were filming the first Jurassic Park. And if you remember, there's a scene of a sick Triceratops, a sick and dying Triceratops, that two of the characters stumble upon. And so this picture is of Steven Spielberg with this sick and dying Triceratops, and it's a facetious post, like, oh no, Steven Spielberg hunting dinosaurs or something like that. I can't remember the details exactly, but it went viral, and there were a lot of people who were outraged and didn't realize, apparently, that one, this dinosaur is extinct, and two, this is a puppet, an animated puppet, but still a puppet. And they were a lot of people who were very angry at Steven Spielberg and declared that they'll never see his movies again and they can't believe that he would hunt an endangered species. So <laughs> it's pretty funny. Anyway, ancestors of Triceratops may have been Zunoceratops, which is the earliest known Ceratopsian with brow horns, and Yinglong, which is the first known Ceratopsian from the Jurassic era. Pentaceratops may have also been an early ancestor, it's Pentaceratops aquilionis. It's a small size of a buffalo dinosaur that was described in 2014 and it was sitting in a museum. Its bones were sitting in a museum for 75 years before it was studied and found to be its own species. It may have been a cousin of Triceratops. It had five horns compared to Triceratops three, but it lived millions of years before Triceratops. It probably migrated from Asia. And if you want to learn more about Pentaceratops aquilionis, we talk about it in episode 15. So again, Triceratops was a Ceratopsian, and Ceratopsians were Ornithischians. Ceratopsians lived in North America and Asia, and they had beaks and cheek teeth to help them eat fibrous vegetation. They also had a frill that they used for defense or regulating body temperature, or possibly attracting mates or even signaling danger. They probably traveled in herds and, by that logic, stampede if threatened. There's a few subfamilies of Ceratopsid. There's the Chasmosaurinae, which they had large brow horns and long frills. And then there's Centrosaurines, which had short brow horns and shorter frills with long spines coming out of the frills. Chasmosaurinae fossils have been found in western Canada and the western U.S., as well as northern Mexico. In our fun fact of the day, I actually learned through that T-Rex autopsy show, there's quite a bit of good information in there sprinkled in amongst a bunch of obvious things to us. But the fun fact is dinosaurs probably had two functioning ovaries, which is not particularly surprising since humans have that too. But birds only have one functioning ovary, and it appears to have evolved for flight. So it, the extra ovary was just kind of extra weight. <laughs> so they evolved not to have it anymore when they started flying. They think this because dinosaur eggs tend to come in pairs, which is something you'd expect when you have two ovaries rather than just one. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening, and until next time.
Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at I Know Dino.